Welcome and good afternoon. My name is Jackie Hoyt and I am the president of the board of the Johann Foos Library Foundation and it's wonderful to see all of you here. I want you to know that the Johann Foos Library Foundation is deeply grateful for your sponsorship of this year's annual benefit but also for your heartfelt support of our beloved library. We wish to especially thank our very loyal corporate sponsor, Northern Trust. And our reception hostess, Director Stephanie Furman. All of your generous support is what enables us to sustain our mission of caring for our beautiful buildings and gardens and to provide a cultural and literary center for the residents and visitors of Boca Grande. This afternoon, we are greatly honored to present to you Emmy Award winning writer and director Stephen Ives, who is considered to be one of the nation's leading documentary filmmakers. While planning for this event, our board concluded there is no one better suited and or appropriate to introduce Stephen than our very own Henry Becton. Henry is currently vice chair of New England's public media giant GBH's board of trustees and former president of WGBH Educational Foundation. He is a director of PRX the nonprofit public media company specializing in audio journalism and storytelling. He is a former member of the PBS Board of Directors and the PBS Foundation Board of Directors. Outside of public media, he serves as director of the Pew Charitable Trust and is a trustee of the New England Conservatory of Music. Over the years, Henry has held numerous positions of distinction and leadership in the realm of arts and education, including the Boston Museum of Fine Arts, the Boston Ballet, and has served on the Board of Governors of the National Academy of Television Arts and Sciences, the New England chapter. He has served on the Dean's Council of Harvard's Graduate School of Education, and the Leadership Council of the Yale University School of Engineering and Applied Science. Henry and his wife Jeannie spend their time between Boca Grande, Blue Hill, Maine, and Boston, and are very proud parents of three children and five grandchildren. And now I think you know why we are very proud and so very fortunate to have Henry as a director of the Johann Foos Library Foundation. Before I turn the microphone over to Henry for his introduction of Stephen Ives, I have a few quick housekeeping items of note. If you haven't done so already, please silence your cell phones. And if you're planning to attend the reception, we hope you are, after the program, uh, you are welcome to drop your guests off at Stephanie's front door. And then please park past Stephanie Furman's house on Jose Gaspar Drive along the lake. So without further ado, ladies and gentlemen, I present to you Henry Becton. Thank you, Jackie. My head is swelling. That was too long an introduction, but um, I didn't mind it. <laughs> uh, it's my great pleasure, however, OK. It's my great pleasure, however, to introduce one of my favorite people in public television, Steve Ives. Uh, he's someone who, as you know, has directed, written, or produced a, the most illustrious documentaries that have been on PBS through WGBH. Um, and every so often, he deigns to work for some other outfit like Home Box Office. Most recently, Steve directed two of the major primetime series on PBS this past fall, a four and a half hour biography of 
um, of William Randolph Hearst for the American Experience, and a four-part, very moving series called American Veteran, which won universal praise in the press. Steve comes from a distinguished family of public media. His father, David Ives, was my predecessor as president of WGBH. If there's anybody here who lived either on Nantucket or in Boston, you probably have seen David on the screen dunning you for pledges during our pledge drives. Uh, he was very good at that. <laughs> but he was also very good as a mentor to me in my career. And so I think, in fact, uh, one might say that Steve and I, in very different ways, share a father figure. <laughs> um, and his father had very good reason to be proud of him. You're going to hear the word Emmy too many times today, but, uh, but he has won so many accolades, Emmys, Directors Guild, and um, Writers Guild awards for his great work. And his landmark series, The West, was one of the most watched series on PBS ever. And one of the critics wrote about it, quote, a breathtaking, beautiful series of films that make riveting TV. Steve studied American history at Harvard, uh, a passion that continues to distinguish his body of work. And in 1987, he started a decade-long collaboration with Ken Burns, first as co-producer of A History of the United States Congress, and then uh, a, as a consulting producer for the landmark series, The Civil War and Baseball. He established his own production company, Insignia Films, and began a long list of outstanding documentaries through that, more than a dozen of which have been on the American Experience series, including uh, Lindbergh and um, the um, uh, Custer's Last Stand, Panama Canal, I could go on. PBS feature, uh, featured his major mini-series, The Great War, about World War one not too many years ago. But my very favorite was a uh, profile he did of the 1930s, uh, you know, thoroughbred Seabiscuit, which won multiple Emmy Awards. It's no exaggeration to say that Stephen has established himself as one of the nation's foremost documentary filmmakers. So please give a warm welcome to Steve Ives. Thank you very much, Henry. Um, that's a very, very kind introduction. Uh, um, one of the things I remember my father telling uh, me when, I, when he was thinking of retiring from WGBH was that he didn't want to wait too long because he was worried that Henry would get bored or restless and move on. And he desperately wanted him to take the reins. And uh, thankfully for the station, the timing worked out perfectly, and Henry led the station with distinction for almost 25 years, which was a remarkable run. And we're grateful to him for doing it. I'm also, Anne and I are so grateful to Bobby Marquis and, and the rest of the members of the Library Foundation for giving us this brief, all too brief immersion in absolute tropical splendor. We were lying on our backs in the surf this morning at 8 AM, thinking about the four inches of snow and dark brown crusted nothingness around our property, and, and it was quite something, let me tell you. I'm, all, I'm glad to see you here because I, I know that you all had the option of attending Biker Week at Daytona today. Uh, and I, I'm glad you chose to have a little public television moment. Um, I understand that uh, folks in Boca Grande are avid fishermen, and that the tarpon that you get pulled out of the bay can be astonishing specimens. But I want to say right at the outset that I'm taking my cue from Mark Twain when he said, don't, do not tell fish stories where the people know you. Particularly, don't tell them where they know the fish. <laughs> uh, I'm, uh, as Henry said, uh, been at this a little while. And uh, I recently um, passed my 30th anniversary uh, at Insignia Films. Uh, and so it sort of feels to me like an appropriate moment to look back at the, the work that I've done. I've been lucky enough to spend a, a good part of my career in the PBS system, and I thought I'd 
share a few stops on my journey with you uh, and introduce you to some of the remarkable people that I've met along the way. As I mentioned, my father was the president of WGBH uh, uh, when I was growing up, as Henry said, and, and I'm not sure if any of you have experienced a public television auction but for one week, WGBH became completely commercial, selling donated items from the community, everything from a year's supply of Dunkin' Donuts to a season pass to the Red Sox to a Lexus sedan. On one occasion, I was watching a presenter auctioning off a huge crystal chandelier, which was hanging behind him in the studio. Halfway through his spiel, the chandelier dropped and shattered into a thousand pieces. Without missing the beat, the auctioneer said, ladies and gentlemen, we're not gonna do the chandelier, we're gonna do the chandelier kit. <laughs> Over the years, I've thought that public television is in some ways a bit like that chandelier. It's an immensely valuable thing that we all treasure, but it's uh, often at the risk of being cut loose from its moorings. We weren't a particularly religious family uh, growing up, um, but we, you know, our, our sermons came from a, a gentleman named Alistair Cook, who introduced us to marvelous programs like the Foresight Saga, Upstairs, Downstairs, and the Duchess of Duke Street. And my first love of history really, I think, was kindled by the fabulous stories about the, uh, Great Britain, uh, stories of struggle, struggle and triumph in sort of hopelessly class-bound and repressed Edwardian England. After college, uh, I ended up living in Texas for a while, uh, and I found myself, as Henry said, drawn to the early films of Ken Burns, films like Brooklyn Bridge and Statue of Liberty, which we, we forget now were absolutely breakthrough films, where nothing like them had really been done before. And I decided that I wanted to be a documentary filmmaker uh, and I, at this moment, I think there were probably six documentary filmmakers in the country. Um, and so I set out to try and understand the American experiment. Uh, and I was drawn to stories and characters that reflected what I thought was the often contradictory nature of this country's experience. Um, and I began making films about people like Kit Carson and Alice Paul and Martin Luther King. I found that these individuals were often remarkable because of and not in spite of their weaknesses and very human frailties. Judged by today's standards, many of these great Americans would have been canceled before they even got started, which is all the more reason, I think, to remember them and what they did. My first film was a biography of Charles Lindbergh um, for the American Experience, and he drew me in right away. He'd been a stunt pilot, a barnstormer, one of the first, one of America's first airmail pilots, which was an exceedingly dangerous job, believe me. But in 1927, at the age of 25, he took his Spirit of St. Louis, a specialized plane he helped design, and he flew it for 33 and a half hours from New York to Paris alone, becoming the first person to fly nonstop across the Atlantic. When he landed, he hadn't slept for 55 hours. And this, let's see if I can get to it. Um, let's see, patience. This odd little uh, film, uh, this uh, uh, curious fr framed letter, was given to me. It's, it's from a man named W. Lee Dixon, who was a playwright and a short story writer, uh, and a former editor of a magazine called Europe. And he was living in Paris on June 21st, 1927, when Lindbergh touched down at Le Bourget Airport, triggering some of the worst traffic jams in French history, as thousands of people headed to the airport to catch a glimpse of the young American. Dixon got there late and managed to talk and bribe, he was in France after all, bribe his way through a series of military checkpoints until he writes, at 2.25 a.m., when the whole world was talking nothing but that plane and its pilot, I had something of a thrill finding myself alone with it and a single mechanic. Another small bribe, and Dixon convinced the mechanic 
to cut off a, a morsel of the torn cloth of the plane where the crowd had ripped at it before it was secured by the military. Dixon ends his letter this way, Lindbergh's feet has captured the French imagination and affectionate enthusiasm. His honors are not limited to those paid by dignitaries. His are more elusive and flattering of having laborers in corner bars go into ecstasies over his accomplishment. Nowhere is there a note of jealousy. The tribute is passionately and freely given. I think the mob would elect him president tomorrow. He is the idol of France, and this, even for a day, is not given to many men. I just love this little window into history, uh, and this, it was such a great moment. If I ever had a chance to attend Antiques Roadshow, this is certainly what I would bring with me. <laughs> Meteoric fame came to Lindbergh, but it turned out to be a burden that would weigh on him throughout his life. So I want to show you a clip from my very first film, Lindbergh, written by Jeffrey C. Ward. Four and a half million New Yorkers turned out for a glimpse of him as he arrived in New York Harbor and rode up Broadway. From coast to coast we all can boast and sing a toast to one who's made a name for being gay. Lucky Lindy, up in the sky, fair or windy, he's flying high. Lucky Lindy, show them the way, and he's the hero of the day. Ladies and gentlemen of the radio audience, this is Graham McNamee speaking from Washington, D.C. Awaiting Lindbergh. Lindbergh is coming down in the gangway, walking slowly. A darn nice boy. Lindbergh was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor, the French Legion of Honor, and the British Air Force Cross. 4,000 poets composed verse in his honor. He received 100,000 telegrams and cables, 14,000 packages, and three and a half million letters. Requests for funds, proposals of marriage, the award of the Silver Buffalo from the Boy Scouts, a German Shepherd, an airplane, and a lifetime pass from the National Association of Professional Baseball Leagues. And there were job offers that would make him a wealthy man. Nobody is prepared for what happens on the scale of what happened to Lindbergh. Nobody could be uh, ready for that. He made his way, he found his way, he became something that he had it in him to become, but it, but it couldn't have been clear from one moment to the next. In the air, he still enjoyed the independence and total control he loved. But on the ground, they were increasingly denied to him. The crowds believed he belonged to them. He wished to belong to no one. At Kansas City, admirers rushed onto the airstrip as he came in, forcing him to crash land in a cornfield. In St. Louis, women fought over a corn cob he had gnawed. When he sent his shirts to the laundry, they were kept as mementos. In Little Falls, Minnesota, where the water tower was proudly painted hometown of Charles A. Lindbergh, souvenir hunters tore the doorknobs off his boyhood home. And he came to resent the newspaper's insatiable, intrusive curiosity about him, and to do all he could to thwart it. What is your destination, Colonel Lindbergh? A reporter asked as he walked to his plane. Indefinite, as always. What general direction are you headed? Up. Some editors wearied of the chase. No more Lindbergh stories, one told his staff, unless he crashes. So my executive producer on Lindbergh was Ken Burns, and I worked with him on his series about the Civil War and baseball. I remember walking around New York City uh, during the initial Civil War broadcast, and the series was playing on bars, uh, and you could see the TVs that normally had sports on playing the Civil War series uh, from the street. And that's sort of when I realized that I, I think Ken had really created something pretty remarkable. 
for the baseball series, I got to work, uh, I got to have lunch with the uh, Roger Angel from The New Yorker. Uh, and as the project continued, we put a segment together on Yogi Berra, which gave me new insights not only into the game of baseball, but into the beauty of our English language. After all, Yogi was the Yankee catcher who uttered the classic words, it's deja vu all over again. He also once said, baseball is 90% mental. The other half is physical. <laughs> when describing the switch hitting outfielder Mickey Mantle, he proclaimed that he hits as good right-handed as he does left-handed. He's just naturally amphibious. <laughs> On being told by the wife of New York Mayor John Lindsay that he looked cool despite the heat, Yogi said, you don't look so hot either. <laughs> if you come to a fork in the road, Yogi said, take it. <laughs> After Lindbergh, Ken was busy directing his baseball series, and I was lucky enough to be given the opportunity to produce and direct a series about the American West. Basically, I went from a film about our national pastime to one about our greatest national myth, the promise and opportunity and triumph of the story of America becoming a continental nation. After Lindbergh, which was an hour long, I suddenly embarked on a 12 and a half hour series that would take me five years to complete. The West has always been a compelling place, what the great writer Wallace Stegner called a geography of hope. Commenting on that astonishing landscape, the Pulitzer Prize winning writer and poet uh, and Kiowa Indian N. Scott Mamaday told me, it needs to be believed, but it also needs to be believed in order to be seen. I came to see the West as a sort of four-way stop sign of American history a place of complex intersections of people. It's a story of the noble idea of manifest destiny, but also the trail of casualties left in its wake. Hollywood created simplistic and reassuring cardboard cutout figures to help us relate to the West. But in our series, we tried to treat each player in the huge drama as a human being, with flawed, sometimes heroic, often selfish or self-serving motivations. Instead of seeing Native people as stereotypical, bloodthirsty savages or paragons of New Age harmony with nature, we tried to present them with their own agency, struggling in a world undergoing unprecedented change. Of all the figures I came to love while making the West, um, none embodied the mythic version of it, like William F. Cody, Buffalo Bill. Cody lived a multitude of Western lives, hunting buffalo to feed the railroad crews, digging gold in the Rockies, dabbling in irrigation, ranching, and going broke, the ultimate Western character trait, just about, in just about all of them. Beginning in the 1870s, Cody realized he could make money by reliving his experiences on the stage. And he began touring the East, starring in a series of melodramas about his exploits on the frontier. Then in 1876, shortly after the Battle of the Little Bighorn, Cody signed on as a scout to avenge the death of Custer. On July 17th, while wearing one of his stage costumes, a black velvet outfit modeled after those worn by Mexican vaqueros with a scarlet sash, silver embroideries, and lace at the collar and cuffs, he helped lead a troop of cavalry within sight of a small band of Cheyenne warriors. There was a fight. One chief fell a bullet through the skull. Cody took his scalp and mailed it to his own sister, who fainted when she opened it. Within weeks, Cody was back on the stage, starring in a production entitled First Scalp for Custer. In the end, though, the small stage proved too confining for Cody, and in 1883, he launched Buffalo Bill's Wild West, an outdoor extravaganza that would imprint his own version of the West on the minds of an entire generation at home and overseas. Here's an excerpt from the West. On Staten Island one summer, a million people attended his shows. Another million paid to see him that winter at Madison Square Garden. Each scene is instructive, one advertisement promised. A year's visit west 
in three hours. In every performance, a wagon train was raided by Indians and saved by Buffalo Bill. A settler's cabin was attacked and saved by Buffalo Bill. There were Pony Express riders, a buffalo hunt, Mexican vaqueros displaying their skill with the lasso, and the authentic Deadwood stagecoach, surrounded by Indians and saved by Buffalo Bill. But the grand finale was a reenactment of the Battle of the Little Bighorn, showing with historical accuracy, the handbills claimed, the scene of Custer's last stand. And at the end, there was Buffalo Bill himself, in the center of the battlefield, while behind him the words, too late, were projected onto a screen. Crowds couldn't get enough of it. Even Libby Custer, who had been widowed by the actual event, proclaimed it the most realistic and faithful representation of a Western life that has ceased to be. She came back to see it many times. It was, the showman boasted, a noisy, rattling, gunpowder entertainment. For millions of people all over the world, William F. Cody had become the embodiment of the West. Buffalo Bill, I think, is the one true genius the 19th century West really produced. Buffalo Bill is an incredible self-creation. What Buffalo Bill knew about the West is that, in fact, it gave you the opportunity to make yourself over. And then once you've made a role for yourself to inhabit it, the lines between reality, the lived experience in the West, and the mythic West that Buffalo Bill portrayed for a living become very, very blurred. In 1885, Sitting Bull himself joined the entourage. Billed as the slayer of General Custer, he was paid $50 a week and reserved the right to profit directly from the sale of autographs and pictures of himself. The aging chief was required only to ride around the arena once a show and afterwards to sign his name for the awestruck visitors who came to peer at him in his teepee. It's interesting for Sitting Bull because, first of all, it, it's a chance for him to see the rest of the world and see what America is about and a lot of Indian people that went with him, interpreters and everything. And they realize that the world has changed and their way of life has changed. And what's happening on the reservations isn't necessarily indicative of what America could be about. I think he was probably, in turns, uh, amused and uh, humiliated by the experience. This was so much unlike the reality that he had lived as a, as a young man, and yet it was a bizarre reflection of that reality, too. So he must have seen his experience from a different angle when he was in the Wild West show. Sitting Bull liked Buffalo Bill, who gave him a handsome hat and the gray horse he'd ridden in the show as gifts. But he could not understand why beggars were left to drift about the streets of big cities, and he gave much of his pay away to newsboys and hobos he met on the tour. This is a show about conquest. This is a show about the conquest of the West. But everything that the audience sees is Indians attacking whites. This is the strange story of an inverted conquest. It's a celebration of conquest in which the conquerors are the victims. And there's something at one level that still is deeply weird about this. What is going on when you celebrate a conquest and you only show yourself being victimized? 
It's conquest won without the guilt. We didn't plan it, they attacked us, and when we ended up, we had the whole continent. Buffalo Bill says the Wild West is over. It's finished, it's done. The conquest of the West has now taken place, and all he can do is reenact it for you. The West is still out there, but it's not the same West that it would have been 10 or 20 years ago. I would have given literally anything to have been at the Wild West show. I mean, that was, has had to have been the most extraordinary. I mean, I used to go to the Fort Worth Fat Stock show in Fort Worth, which was amazing in itself, but that must have been. And what was so remarkable was that a lot of the native people who were in that show had literally come off the high plains and had been fighting uh, federal tro uh, US troops only a decade earlier. Uh, so you weren't just seeing stand-ins, you were seeing people who actually lived the experience that Buffalo Bill was portraying, but through his extraordinarily mythic showmanship lens. Um, when we did the cover for the West companion book, I picked a picture of the Wild West Company because it represented all of the different constituencies that were vying for control and a life in that vast landscape. Mexican vaqueros, native people, cowboys, ranchers, the whole group. And it was just kind of, they were all in one photo, like a class picture of the American West. Sometimes I sought out, you know, historical stories like Lindbergh, but other times history found me. In the 1990s, I was living near the Bowery in New York City and was curious about a little building next to the punk rock club CBGB's, which is where the Talking Heads and a bunch of other bands got their start. I'm sure you were all there in the 70s. Um, and this little building housed something called the Amato Opera. And inside it, I discovered a world that was both a piece of New York history and also a window into the lives of an extraordinary, extraordinary septuagenarian couple, Tony and Sally Amato. These amazing people staged fully realized operas in their renovated brownstone, often on a stage barely bigger than a living room. Don Giovanni, Rigoletto, Aida, without the elephants. The Amato Opera did them all. And they sometimes served pasta and meatballs during intermission. I wasn't an opera fan, but the Amato was celebrating its 50th anniversary season, and I decided I had to go along for the ride. Push it up. Yeah. That'll hold it, you see? Now, as we okay. come this way, I think, knowing that you're going to be here now quite a few months with us, I think you should know where everything is approximately. When we first did AIDA, 45 years ago, Kathy, we have very little financial resources. We still have, but we're not as bad as we used to be. So we went out and bought, the, oh, a couple of dozen of mops. <laughs> Dyed them black. You see? No, that, it does look nice on. So. Don't put it on. Oh, yeah. uh, see. There we go. See? Now, <laughs> when you go in the audience, say, about 20 feet away, 15 feet away, uh, you'll never know that this is a mop. <laughs> and that's how the amount of opera survived. The secret is they were always planning ahead. So I think we're going to have to always planning what opera is next. And we're so involved with that opera that we forget what opera we just did last week. The French repertoire, the Puccini repertoire here. And planning the costumes and the properties. Hello to the audience. And you know. <laughs> and the staging and the casting. The performance, the cast, my orchestra. Makes me feel sick to my stomach. <laughs> now to think that his mind's got all this, he's got all that in his mind. That cluttered up. Eight to ten different casts. Doing the operas is fun. During the show, it's, it's great fun. While the saber, you need the broadest strength, you slash away 
I like Errol Flynn, you know? The hardest thing is the work. There's so much of it. Keeping up with the physical part of things as you get older. Although Tony still climbs on 18-foot ladders. Sally, during the show, executes all the lighting. I run the light board. That's my job. If anything goes wrong with the lights, you'll hear it from him. I'm lucky when I married her. She has many hats. All the business in the office. See how it works here? Bookkeeping, advertising, fitting the singers. See why I love my work? I know you do. Okay. Pinning fat people, skinny people. Pinning like crazy. Because without safety pins, <laughs> there could be no opera. Nothing made me, oh, nothing made me feel better than to be around those two people. They were just uh, the, some of the one, most wonderful people I'd ever met. And their orchestra pit really was a pit dug into the sub-basement of the Amato. And Tony, uh, Sally told me once that a woman came to her and said, Mrs. Amato, uh, my daughter, she plays the violin. Could you use her in your orchestra? And Sally said, I'm sorry, darling. We, we only use vertical instruments. <laughs> they literally couldn't fit much more into the, into the thing. Um, so another story came to me uh, in a more conventional way. Um, I happened to glance at the cover of American Heritage magazine um, the day it arrived at my apartment, and I saw an article about a little-known racehorse from the 1930s named Seabiscuit. And I was intrigued, and I read the piece and was completely swept away by this rags-to-riches story of a hard-luck thoroughbred who became a hero to millions of Americans during the Great Depression. So I reached out to the little-known writer Laura Hillenbrand, and she turned out to have been a fan of the West, and we agreed to make a documentary, even though the feature film uh, that Universal Pictures had already uh, signed her up for was already in the works. Uh, Seabiscuit debuted at number four on the New York Times bestseller list. So after a year of me trying to tell the folks at WGBH that I had this great story about this little racehorse, they finally said, oh, you still want to make that? And I said, I sure do. Um, so throughout his astonishing rise to the top of the racing world, there was one horse that Seabiscuit never faced. And remember that Seabiscuit was not an inspiring looking thoroughbred. He looked sort of like a horse that ought to be drawing a cart full of ice along the streets of New York somewhere. But the one he never faced was the noble and imperious son of man of war, whose name was War Admiral. Finally, after a series of mishaps that prevented the matchup from taking place, including a devastating injury to Seabiscuit's regular jockey, Red Pollard, the great match race was finally on. Millions of racing fans in America and abroad look anxiously toward the richest match race in the history of the sport of kings. By the fall of 1938, the Seabiscuit War Admiral matchup had been rescheduled. They would meet one-on-one -on -one November 1st at Maryland's Pimlico Race Course. Race finally becomes a reality. Here is Seabiscuit. The whole country is divided in two camps, the San Francisco Chronicle observed. People who never saw a horse race in their lives are taking sides. The crowd makes War Admiral an odds on favorite. George Wolfe had signed on to ride Seabiscuit, and for the first time in his career, he wasn't sure he would win. The night before the race, he'd even called Pollard for advice. His instructions have been simple, if highly unorthodox. Gun Seabiscuit at the start, he told Wolf, and then let War Admiral catch up. Once a horse gives Seabiscuit the old look in the eye, Pollard said, he begins to run to parts unknown. 30,000 people filled the grandstand that afternoon. Another 10,000 jammed into the infield. Outside the track, 10,000 more gathered 10 deep around the fence and scrambled up tree limbs and telephone poles as far as a mile from the start. 
I was in the grandstand. I was squeezed in. That's how many people were there. I was squeezed in just around the 316th pole where the horses broke. It was a two-horse extravaganza. I mean, they had built the race to uh, an outstanding pitch. Everybody knew what was coming that particular day. I mean, it was in the air. It, it engulfed you. It was just like waiting for the bell to ring. Down at the paddock gate, the announcer, Clem McCarthy, began to make his way to the radio booth. But the crowd was so thick he couldn't get through. Ladies and gentlemen, I found it impossible to get through this enormous throng at Pimlico today. The first time that I've ever failed to do that from the paddock. So he climbed up on the track's outer rail, down by the wire, and settled in to call the race from there. Across the country, 40 million listeners, one out of every three Americans, tuned into the broadcast. And they're off in this third, it's a go! And Georgie Wolf is at the whip on sea biscuit to keep him up. And they're coming to me head and head. War Admiral on the inside. Wolf is driving sea biscuit, and sea biscuit is out running him. Sea biscuit is coming to me. One length, two lengths in the lead. And he came right over two lengths. He goes down in. Sea biscuit by two lengths. War Admiral right on his heels. War Admiral is trailing him around the turn. Sea biscuit on the lead by two lengths. War Admiral is second to him, and Kurt Singer sitting still. Now War Admiral's trying to move to him. They're going into the back stretch. Sea biscuit by a length and a half. Now Sea biscuit by two lengths. War Admiral second. Sea biscuit by two lengths. They've got three quarters of a mile to come. And it's Sea biscuit by a length and a half down the back stretch. They're halfway down that back stretch, and there goes War Admiral after him. Now the horse race is on. And now War Admiral has a head advantage, and Seabiscuit's got a head advantage. They're going into that far turn as they head for that home lane. This is a real horse race, just what we hoped we'd get. They're head and head, and both suckies driving. It's the best horse from here in. They've got 200 yards to come. It's horse against horse. Both of them driving. Seabiscuit leads by a length. Now Seabiscuit by a length and a half. Wilkes put away his weapon. Seabiscuit by three. Seabiscuit by three. Seabiscuit is the winner by four lengths. And you never saw such a wild crowd. Seabiscuit the winner by four lengths. Trying to drown this crowd out here. They're roaring around me. Seabiscuit was the winner. Seabiscuit's final time blazed across the tote board. No horse in Pimlico's history had ever run the distance so fast. Speed of that kind, one turf scribe said, is what's known as kissing the boys goodbye. It's a hero's reception, T-Biscuit, undisputed king of thoroughbreds. He rewards his bankers with $6.40 for each $2, and that's certainly worth a blanket of blood. Seabiscuit did just what I thought he'd do, Pollard told a columnist the next day. He made a rear admiral out of war admiral. Oh, I love the biscuit. It was such a great. And when uh, you see uh, Sea Biscuit's jockey say something to War Admiral's jockey, War Admiral's jockey was named Charlie Kurtzinger. And I think that's where the phrase, so long, Charlie, was coined. Uh, I'm not sure about that. But um, I've heard the uh, owner of Smarty Jones lives in Boca Grande. Is that correct? Um, and that horse was the first thoroughbred to capture the imagination of my daughter, Campbell. Uh, as Smarty rounded the final turn at the Belmont, I can still remember her screaming at the top of her lungs, come on, Smarty! And as I recall, he came up just short that day. But I've always been intrigued by how horses got their names. At one screening for Seabiscuit, I heard about a dam whose name was Run for Nurse, and the sire's was Bedpan. The cult they created, look out below. <laughs> if you spend any time studying the nation's history, you realize that the question of race is at the root of almost everything in America. It's burned into the DNA of our government through tragic compromises at the Constitutional Convention. It's impossible to ignore in our nation building westward. And it still dominates our national conversation to this day. 
I had a chance to confront this aspect of our history when I made a film based on a book by the best-selling author Hampton Sides about the assassination of Martin Luther King and the manhunt for James Earl Ray. What was unique about what Hampton did is he really tried to understand who Ray was, where he came from, and how such a nobody, such a low-life drifter and escaped convict, could have taken down such an extraordinary figure as King. Ray presented a huge challenge to me as a filmmaker because he was a man who'd spent his entire life trying to be invisible. So I chose to try and bring his story alive through stylized recreations. What I didn't realize before I made the film was that King was in the midst of organizing a massive poor people's campaign in Washington. And he'd taken time out to go to Memphis in the spring of 1968 to lead a march in support of the city's striking all black sanitation workers. One of the workers had been crushed by one of the trucks uh, and none of them were, they were barely being paid a living wage. But violence had broken out between young activists and a trigger-happy Memphis Police Department, and King had been hustled away from the rioting. Here's a clip from Roads to Memphis. He was being ridiculed for leaving, and he decided he had to go back and resume the struggle. Memphis became a great test of whether nonviolence could work in a situation where violence was prevailing. I talked to him after the march dissolved into violence. And then everybody started talking about King has passed it, he's lost it, he doesn't have blah, 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 blah. I said, I wouldn't go there again if I were you. I just wouldn't do it. And he said, I'm going to do it. And I said, why are you going to do it? Why are you going to do it? He said, because I promised them. Because I promised them. If anybody is to be hurt or killed, in the disorder which follows in the wake of his highly publicized marches and demonstrations, he apparently is going to be sure that it will be someone other than Martin Luther King. Now, what happened yesterday in Memphis was totally uncalled for, just as Martin Luther King's proposed march on Washington is uncalled for and unnecessary. And I hope that well-meaning Negro leaders and individuals in the Negro community in Washington will now take a new look at this man who gets other people into trouble and then takes off like a scared rabbit. That those who got out of hand the other day have now been talked with sufficiently uh, to guarantee that nothing will take place in terms of violence. And uh, I feel that we can still have a nonviolent demonstration and that we will have a nonviolent demonstration here in Memphis. The important thing. Ray is very aware of what's going on in King's life. He is very aware King is embroiled in a, a, a battle in Memphis. They announced the specific date that he, King would be returning to Memphis. Uh, and it gave Ray a little bit of time to react. So Ray goes to Birmingham and buys a rifle under the name Harvey Lohmeyer. Ray was in the Army. He joins at 17. He's not a natural soldier by any means. He chafes at any kind of authority. He's drunk, he's AWOL, but the Army does teach him how to shoot well. When he buys a Remington Game Master 30-06 rifle with a scope, 30-06 was the standard military round. Every time you fired it, you pumped the the fore end and the shell would eject and another shell would, would load and had a little clip that fit into the bottom and held about five shots. It's a great killing rifle. It's much better than the rifle, the cheap rifle that Oswald used to kill Kennedy. It's a good killing machine. 30 odd six is a good slug. Um, and I don't mean that in a cavalier way. It was a, a good assassin's weapon. This is the first time that his idea of killing King has gone from the abstract to something very, very tangible. He's holding this rifle and he's realizing that he's probably gonna 
He's going to go through with this. As far as we know, Ray has never killed anyone. We don't think he's ever shot anybody before. He's a criminal. He's a sociopath. We know that. But he is not an easy character to pigeonhole. He's not a firebrand who's out there at the forefront of racial politics or racial hatred. What was clear is this. He buys the gun in Alabama. From the 29th on, he can kill King at any point. It's just a question of opportunity. Um, another animating thread that, that uh, weaves through our common experience is the place of a free press in America. I made a series about war correspondents uh, a while back, which shed light on their particular brand of heroism. And just this past year, as Henry mentioned, I made a film about William Randolph Hearst, a man who perhaps more than anyone else helped sow the seeds of today's intensely polarized and often fact-free discourse. Beginning with the lowly San Francisco Examiner in 1887, Hearst built America's first modern media empire with the help of his family's vast fortune and his unerring sense of what the working man wanted from the news. His appetite for power was limitless. So were his arrogance and his hubris. And he proved himself in the newspaper wars against Joseph Pulitzer on the streets of New York in the 1890s. So fierce was their competition that at one point they both published a popular comic strip character of a street urchin wearing a yellow smock which earned them the nickname Yellow Journalism. Then, when Cuban revolutionaries rose up against their Spanish colonial masters in the late 1890s, Hearst saw an opportunity. Hearst is beginning to formulate a plan that this is an event that we can actually be a part of in a way that no other newspaper is. He's sending correspondence to Cuba that were sending these breathless updates that were often highly exaggerated, but were unbelievably entertaining. Hearst published story after story from Cuba, each more sensational and less tethered to reality than the last. He soon zeroed in on an 18-year-old revolutionary named Evangelina Cisneros, who'd been imprisoned without a trial. The journal published wildly melodramatic articles about her plight. Then Hearst had one of his reporters smuggle her out of Havana, disguised as a man and smoking a Cuban cigar. Cisneros arrived in New York a sensation. Hearst paraded her around the city like his own personal war trophy, hosting an elaborate dinner in her honor at Delmonico's, a ball at the Waldorf, and a rally at Madison Square Garden that drew 75,000. His frenzied coverage brought more and more readers to the journal and branded Spain as enemy number one. Then on February 15, 1898, off the coast of Havana, a battleship called the USS Maine exploded. Two hundred and sixty-six American sailors were dead. Hearst was convinced that Spain was to blame and was determined to seize the opportunity. Arouse everybody, Hearst telegrammed his team. Maine is a great thing. This point is when he began to, for the first time, cross these lines. What he did was so beyond the bounds of acceptable journalism by any standard. Hearst immediately publishes on his front pages a variety of stories going after the Spanish, all made up. The battleship Maine was probably an accident Everything suggests that it was an accident. But at that point, it was impossible to simmer everybody back down. So war seemed inevitable at that point, and Hearst loved it. Hearst was well aware that this was the biggest story of his career, and he intended to push it as far as he could. 
The Spaniards were not men, but beasts, he claimed, and proceeded to spread outright lies about their troops savaging women, poisoning children, and feeding prisoners of war to sharks. Pulitzer had recently jumped on the bandwagon as well, and the world was soon trafficking in reporting almost as sensational as Hearst's. Now, both Hearst and Pulitzer were demanding that the president declare war at once. William McKinley, a moderate Republican who'd won the White House on a business-friendly ticket two years earlier, remained cautious. War should never be entered upon until every agency of peace has failed, the president maintained. But with every paper sold, the calls for war grew louder. The unrelenting, over-the-top warmongering Hearst and Pulitzer engaged in earned them a new nickname, Yellow Kid Journalists. Nothing troubles the yellow journalist, one critic complained. His object is sordid and mercenary. His cries for blood. The more of it, the better. Yellowdom's strong point, another stated, is the total disregard for truth and dignity. The whole idea of the yellow press was that these are trash papers that publish gossip, publish scandal, and also are riling up the masses. The spiral of sensationalism that Pulitzer and Hearst were drawn into, I think it made it a lot easier to cross lines that they might not have crossed without the heat of competition pushing them onward. Now the journal was lambasting McKinley almost daily, denouncing him as weak and indecisive. Finally, on April 20th, 1898, McKinley asked for a declaration of war. Hearst was more than happy to take the credit. You know, it just occurs to me that um, Buffalo Bill's experience resonates so much today when you think about Zelensky, uh, the president of Ukraine right now. I don't know whether all of you know, but he was a sitcom star in Ukraine and a very popular comedian both in Ukraine and in Russia. And his character in the sitcom decides to run for president and is elected. Uh, and now then he went and did the exact same thing. So it really is this extraordinary sort of fantasy becoming reality. Um, and I think any time you look at reporting, uh, like we're looking at right now from all sides about what's going on in Ukraine, you realize the effect, the ripple effect in some ways that Hearst and his publications have had on not only American journalism, but journalism across and around the world. Um, you know, he, Hearst dispatched the artist Frederick Remington to Cuba uh, during the war. And after a week on the island, uh, Remington sent a cable and he said there was no conflict for him to draw. And Hearst is supposed to have said, you furnish the pictures, I'll furnish the war. Um, so for 30 years, I've been in search of history. And I feel lucky to have had such interesting historical figures um, for my companions. Uh, of course, history is ultimately a collection of stories that we tell ourselves about the past to make sense of the present. In, Pres in President Kennedy's phrase, we celebrate the past to awaken the future. William Faulkner saw it another way. The past is never dead, he said. It's not even past. But I think history matters because it often provides the context so desperately lacking in the hyperbolic diatribes and the shallow pandering that, that passes for uh, what our media today. History matters because it's can breed a healthy and informed skepticism and can imbue your worldview with something often in short supply in American life, a feeling of humility and compassion. Humility because time and again you see how flawed great men and women are, are and how hard they've had to struggle to succeed, how lost and uncertain they often have been. Compassion for the victims of progress, for those who have paid a bitter price for this nation's extraordinary ascendance. Most of all, history matters because it can inspire us to be something 
greater than ourselves, both as citizens and as a nation. And at a moment when facts and truth and a respect for our traditions and our norms is under assault as never before, it has never been more important, I think, to remember our own stories and where we've been as a people. Well, these days, instead of being one of six documentary filmmakers in the country, I think I'm probably one of 6,000 or so and counting. Um, at Insignia Films, we're making a film about an experiment in universal basic income in Kenya, exploring the secret history of the board game Monopoly, which was actually invented by a woman in 1904. And I recently compiled, uh, completed a profile of America's first female landscape architect, Beatrix Farrand, which I produced with my wife, the horticulturist, Ann Sims. We also just finished a biography of the great choreographer Alvin Ailey. The film premiered at the Sundance Film Festival in 2021 and is now streaming on Hulu. And I thought I'd leave you with a little trailer for that film in the hopes that maybe you might want to tune in some evening when it's raining in Boca Grande. Do you feel as though you had to sacrifice anything to stay and dance? Everything. The Alvin Ailey American Dance Theater is one of the most important contemporary dance companies in the world. People were just, oh my God, they'd never seen anything like it. Choreographers start with an empty space, a body or two, and we say, carve the space. I love creating something where there was nothing before. I was born in the Depression, 1931. Rural country, tough times. When I was 14, I discovered the theater. And it touched something in me, but there was no body life. Alvin entertained my dreams that a black boy could actually dance. Being able to say through the choreography, I am, it transcends dance. I had my own ideas. Not just to do a step, but to feel something. He was working at a feverish pitch, totally immersed. People say, why is he doing that now? If you're a black anything in this country, people want to put you into a bag. This is what he took up as his crusade. Alvin's protest was on the stage. I want to feel all the anger and the sense of cursing at the outside room. I wanted to do the kind of dance that could be done for the man on the street, the people, that it was part of their culture. And that it was universal. I'm not going to try and follow Alvin Ailey, so I'll just say thank you all very much for having me here. Uh, I'd be happy to answer a few questions if anybody has any, if you want to raise your hand. Um, yes? Yeah, well, I needed a logo, and I felt like the plane was a symbol of innovation and, and kind of a very forward-thinking idea. And then a focus group talked me out of it about two years ago, and we changed our logo. I mean, Lindbergh, as you know, probably ran into some very complicated problems with anti-Semitism and, and had a kind of problem, which was that he was unfailingly in command in the cockpit of an airline, an airplane. But off out of that setting, he was often adrift. Uh, and people turned to him and assumed that he had that foresight, that knowledge, that control. And they put him in a very awkward position sometimes. And so in these days, we decided that my logo had to be retired, but it's still my favorite. So yes? Um, in these days, there's so many outlets for documentaries. Has the business changed dramatically? Uh, in how you sell your product or how you think about it? 
radically transformed. How, uh, tell me a little bit how that all works. Well, uh, there's a tremendous amount of money floating around in the industry now. But in the old days, there was PBS and there was HBO, and that was pretty much it. But now there's everybody, Netflix and Apple and you know Hulu and you name it. Um, and what's happened, unfortunately, is that not surprisingly, the market is now dictating what's getting made to a much greater degree than before. So uh, you find a lot of reality TV themed ideas. You find things that um, are going to sell, things that aim at a specific demographic, namely my daughter. Um, I was told by an executive at Netflix that uh, they're not interested in history before uh, 1990. So I'm like, well, I think there's a little bit of history before 1990, last time I checked. Um, so it's been a challenge. Uh, we've reached out. We, we, we um, were lucky enough to work with an incredibly talented African-American director named Jamila Wignot on Ailey. Um, increasingly, uh, for a company like ours, when we want to do stories about BIPOC subjects, we look to forge relationships with people of color who can bring a particular perspective to those stories. because. I originally thought up the idea of doing Alvin Ailey. My, my daughter actually auditioned for their summer program, and I've, the only time I've been more nervous in their building when I was you know, pitching, I wasn't as nervous pitching the project to the Ailey company as I was when my daughter was auditioning uh, you know, a couple. Um, but um, you know, I think uh, th these are when we can forge good partnerships. Jamila brought a perspective to this story that, that I never could have no matter how good a job I'd done as a director. And I think that that's a really important lesson for us to keep in mind um, when we take on these subjects. It's time for new storytellers. It's time for people who have a new perspective. And, and if we can give them a platform to help realize those stories, then I think that's an important part of what we do. At the same time, it's also not as easy as it used to be to find stories that a straight white guy my age can make. So uh, there's that tension in the industry. And, but I think it's a, it's, a, it's a healthy one as long as it doesn't move too far in either direction. So. Any other questions? Well, Stephen, this has been fantastic. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you all very much.